word to describe a movement that is both beautiful and awkward. Uh, myself included in that uh, last night. Uh, we, we built a movement. I swear like I almost decapitated someone and I apologize. Uh, but love and trust and how those two lead us to collaborate and you know lead us towards where we ended yesterday. Real talk. Real talk that really needs to continue. Um, I'm grateful for all, all the folks in the room. I, I want us again to give our deepest, deepest thanks to Alex and his work yesterday at the Moose Lodge. We had a, we closed with, with an absolutely essential conversation in the last plenary. And we moved into an equally essential performance by Mary Swander. And I want to give our deep thanks to Mary as well. The, the continuum of the cultural and the structural and the economic conversation we need to have, and that so, many, so much of our work is raising up, I think, was narrated um, really powerfully between what happened in the last two hours of our time together yesterday. I want, I want to make, uh, again, in thinking about the rural, uh, you know, the rural cultural condition we're in and the precarious moment that we all seem to feel that we're in, um, I, I want to sort of really celebrate something that is really important about rural communities. I, and I feel it is really different about um, the experience of our brothers and sisters in urban America. Um, it's, it's easy to be in a, a, like a, a padded room of narratives, especially in the last eight months. Uh, depending on where you get your news, your vision of the world is different. Um, I want to celebrate the folks that are in the room and celebrate our communities, uh, because while all that is true, as you all know, like, we all got to go to the same grocery store. You know? And I think so much of the vision that we heard yesterday were uh, not only in passion, but there was so much common value there. We, we, we negotiate these things every day in our small communities, our medium-sized communities, and our urban communities. You know, and it happens in the bread aisle. And we're accountable to folks in those communities in the bread aisle as well. Um, that just really powerfully came to me yesterday. And in hearing and having a chance to be in the room with you all. Um, in a moment, I want to introduce uh, Chuck Fluharty, uh, who has uh, the deep honor of being my father. <laughs> and, uh, and also, fully acknowledged. Uh, uh, as you all know, is, is the uh, founder and CEO of Rubri. Uh, what I would like to leave us with as, as just one more bridge um, is as I look out to the folks in the room and the folks that I, I've had to know and I've had the honor of knowing in um, the, the nearly six years that Art of the World's been around. Um, in, in, in those six and seven years, We've seen a lot of projects. There are a lot of folks who have done powerful projects who are no longer doing them. I know there are folks in this room, there are folks around the field whose projects we celebrate who may no longer be doing those in a year, in six months, in two years. And I think we really, before we have the conversation that we're gonna have today, we, we really need to hold that. There is immense, immense promise in this field and in the space that we are creating together uh, and, and, you know, these, these tough negotiations between sectors and between fields, there's a lot of promise there. There's also intense fragility. And um, we really have to feel that and, and honor that. And I feel so deeply honored to be with you all. Because um, every day we work through that in rural communities across the sectors that we're in. Um, with that, I'd like to pass the mic here to my dad, Chuck. Thank you. <coughs> I'd just like to say my wife, Marcia, who's back here, and I are very, very proud of how this gentleman overcame his early parenting. <laughs> Raised by wolves. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Rural people. Uh, yesterday was really amazing to me. It was energizing. It was challenging, it was uplifting, it was tiring. <laughs> but above all, for me personally, it was valid.
consolidating of all that are to the rural and rupery believed could happen and risk to have happened in terms of organizational, personal, and financial cost. So again, I want to reiterate what Matt said. We're so deeply grateful that you came to this today. I'd just like for us as a community to thank our presenters, our moderators, our performers, <coughs> the people that grew, prepared, and served our food, the wonderful wait staff and staff that Molly has in this beautiful venue. Let's express our sincere appreciation. Remember, Grandma said, give thanks a lot of the time and mean it. Let's express appreciation. not yet been built, 
in rural arts and culture. And it needs to be. <coughs> I'd like now to thank the third person beside the dean and the provost to made this possible. And this is all about people. We were hoping Secretary Vilsack could keynote this event. And until a couple days ago, he was going to. You can start dimming the lights now if you would. I'm not fading away. We're going to do a tech thing here. <laughs> Don't start it yet, though. I was honored last week with many folks in this room to be at the White House Rural Summit at Penn State talking about rural quality of life. In your packet, is a history of what the White House Rural Council has done in this administration. For 30 years in public policy, Rupery worked to give place primacy in federal policy. This administration has enveloped that and built it. So Tom Vilsack chaired that council, and we really wish he could have been here today, because in my humble opinion, he is the finest servant leader rural America has ever had in an, in an appointed public office in our government. <laughs> Three points. He cares about agriculture, but he cares about all of agriculture. He cares about rural development, but he cares about all of its forms and he cares about arts and culture. I'm now honored, wishing indeed he could be here, but you know the more I thought about it, I went through the seven stages of grief on the secretary. <laughs> First I was angry as hell. You know, God, we've worked with you forever, can't you come? You know, this is like a 25th year celebration for Rupert because we had our 25th great earmarks had gone away and we were going away and we're still here and come and celebrate. Then I got hurt. Then I got accepting, and then I realized how damn stupid I had been. He is working today to assure that the future of our nation is secure. So I present to you now our Secretary of Agriculture with a message to you all, Tom Bilsack. Agriculture Secretary Tom Vilsack. Thank you to Rupri, the University of Iowa, the Appalachian Regional Commission, and the Delta Regional Authority for making this possible. USDA is happy to join with these groups to support this summit, including through the partnership of a number of our state directors. Last week at the White House Rural Forum, we convened a discussion on the people and potential of rural America. We had panels and roundtables featuring topics such as economic drivers in rural places, the future of rural regions, and the Rural Young Leaders Making a Difference section. Chuck Flaherty was there, and he was witness to one of the themes that emerged, the need to lift up the cultural assets of rural places so people, and particularly young families, want to call small towns and rural communities their home. Pennsylvania Governor Tom Wolf, who previously served as an Economic Development Director, talked about his experience meeting with high school students each year. He'd asked them, what would make them want to come back home after college? And it became clear to him that the community needed things for young people to be a part of and to enjoy. Whitney Kimball Cole, the Athens, Tennessee leader from the National Rural Assembly, talked about how one of the assets of her small town is an active and engaged arts council that supports regular and weekly engagement of the local community with local artists. And I had a chance to talk about how, over the course of this administration, the White House Rural Council and USDA have taken a new approach to rural development to engage and support rural communities in growing their economies and improving quality of life. For more and more communities, this means creating art and celebrating their artists. It means building places for people to come together, and it means examining their traditions and looking forward to their future. The conference today is a very important step. While USDA, the National Endowment for the Arts, and other federal partners have helped create public spaces, community centers, and infrastructure, the real essential ingredient of great places 
is the people. People like you at the summit who have committed your time and talents to the future of your community. I want to thank you for this work because rural America is important, not only to the people who live there, but to the very fabric of this nation. So I also want to thank you, and I want to challenge you to continue to work together so that everyone in rural places has a chance to reach their potential. I don't know how you do this, but I, I'd like to suggest we work to get him to be Secretary of Agriculture in the next 15 administrations. <laughs> I'd like to ask the panel to come up, be seated now, if you would. You know, everything today has been a reflection of what started yesterday. And it's really about people. And I'm so honored today to have a set of very dear friends who quite frankly in their sum represent the people that really have made placemaking work and that will sustain it nationally. Now this is a definite division from yesterday and let me just introduce these folks briefly. Many of you know them already, but first of all, uh, Chris Massengale, who's federal co-chair of the Delta Regional Authority. Linda Langston, who is, let me get her title right, Director of Strategic Relations with the National Association of Counties. Doug O'Brien, who actually uh, was central to the development, frankly, of the White House Rural Council within the Domestic Policy Council of the United States. Let me say that again. The rural development future of this administration was led by a rural council in the domestic policy council of our nation. In my wildest dreams, I never thought I would ever utter those words in this nation. Next is Earl Gould, a very dear friend of us all, federal co-chair of the Appalachian Regional Commission. Jamie Bennett, who you all know, executive director of Art Place, and just Jason Shupak, who directs design programs for NEA. Here's the plan for the morning. We're going to have a dialogue, and this is going to be very free flow. At that point, we're going to take a little break. Teresa is going to come up here, and we're going to engage all of you with these leaders for two hours. We don't need to rush. We have time. Then we'll have a box lunch, and we hope these round tables and these flip charts let us have functions that you'd like to stay together to work on in the future. So we're very, very grateful for these national leaders. And let me just kick it off with a, with a softball question uh, that these folks would take it to anywhere because they're all pretty good. Uh, two questions. And let's just start you down the line. If it's okay, Chris, we'll just go this way. That's why nobody took this. Way. <laughs> <laughs> That's not what I hear. So let's just talk about placemaking, where you are, <coughs> the role that both rural and arts and culture have been in your work, and then the guideposts for the future. How are we going to go forward together in a federal, state, NGO partnership? to sustain this amazing growing infrastructure. Chris, go ahead. Five to six minutes on just where you are at this point. <coughs> well, let me start by uh, saying good morning. And so thank you for yeah. yeah, we probably do. Do I have a technician or is it working truck? Yes. Good morning. Perfect. Well, thank you very much for giving us an opportunity to partner with you. Uh, Chuck, your work at Rubri uh, stands um, the test of all kinds of dynamics in this business. And your leadership and vision for this is, has truly uh, been amazing. Uh, in particular, for, particularly, particular for folks like me. And I'll be, uh, let me confess a couple of things to you, which are 
helps you kind of have a little bit of context how I come to the table on this. I am very much a traditional uh, economic developer. I spent most of my adult career going after smoke smokestacks, right? Going after the big elks in economic development. Uh, that's how I was trained. That's how I got into government and in politics was trying to help close deals. Uh, and so the good thing was, though, is that if you all won't tell anybody, I happen to be a theater geek. <laughs> and I realized I couldn't uh, make a living like I wanted to. So I had to think about a couple other things. And then I got attracted to, to government and policy making and realized the kind of impact that we can have on things that we care about, like arts and culture, the things that we know make a great community, make us who we are as a people, something that we believe in pretty strongly. And then fast forward, so here I am at the Delta Regional Tour, uh, an economic uh, development entity, an independent federal agency uh, that tries to be a leverage to help create jobs, build communities, and improve lives. That's what we do every day. And I am a firm believer, after kind of a, a history in economic development, to try to change the, the conversation a little bit, uh, particularly at the local level and with practicing economic development. Because this is sometimes a difficult conversation to have, uh, particularly in some of our places that we represent. The DRA is eight states, 252 counties and parishes, uh, almost 10 million people, and one of the most historic, iconic cultural places in the country. When you look at the impact on music, food, well, that's right, on the world, Doug, you're absolutely right. That places like Mississippi, Louisiana, Alabama, Tennessee, Kentucky, and all these, these wonderful, incredible places. And when you look at some of the things that they've been trying to do, this is actually fairly recent. If you look at the just historic and iconic place where we are housed, where our office is, in Clarksdale, Mississippi, Tahoma County, in the heart of the Mississippi Delta region, okay, population of about 12,000 in the city, may have 16,000 in the county, but it was the place of Muddy Waters, Robert Johnson, the crossroads, your blues guy like me, you you get to go to work every day right in one of the most sacred places of blues, right? It was really not until 1995 that they actually started to try to do some real, what we would consider now, creative placemaking, that quality of place. They were so focused for so long on the agricultural base of their economy, <clears throat> trying to increase the industrial recruitment, which is important. Please don't misunderstand me. And actually, one of the points that I want to make to this audience of such incredible people, I mean, you all are making this stuff happen every day. You're bringing this mindset to the table in some real ways. But what is interesting when I think about this is that when I think about the challenges and the opportunities, I have to first think about, when we're dealing with the kind of challenges in our part of the world, we have to be very disciplined, <coughs> diligent, and purposeful about making sure when we're talking about community and economic development, we are having specific conversations about creative place making now. Now we can define it, we can talk about it, we can actually have real examples of how we're doing this. In Clarksdale, I had mentioned, the biggest thing that they did for three decades was to build something called the Delta Museum. That's all that they had until almost 2000s, and then all of a sudden, you started <coughs> seeing other great studios, arts and residency programs, other local place-based pieces. But even today, right now, they have an internal conflict in the community because the community is extremely divided, because a lot of the conversations are not inclusive, You've got a whole segment of the population that's being left behind economically. The issues of educational attainment. We're dealing with a 100-year-old infrastructure. We've got places that do not even have clean running water. So when we have conversations about how we're addressing these ideas, we have to be extremely uh, aware that when we're talking about making investments in arts and culture, we're not doing that in a vacuum. We're not doing it in place of making investments in infrastructure and doing industrial recruitment. And Chuck, you, you've reminded us of this a hundred times in even publications that you have produced. It's not either or, right? This is both. 
and you got to be able to really show people how you can do that and the impact and the effectiveness that it will have on creating jobs, building communities, and improving lives. And that's done with collaboration and partnerships. But the other thing that has really resonated with me in this post at the DRA is that you truly have to have resources. You've got to have the investments. And what we've tried to do is to be that first in or the bridge or to come in behind and go, you know what, we're going to invest in this cultural project and this tourism project and this arts and culture, whatever it happened to be tagged at the time, because it shows that you have policymakers communicating to local elected officials and local leaders that this type of project is important, that its impact on increasing your local tax base is significant. The impact that it has on growing your own identity, the impact that it has for your young people to be successful. There are direct links to these types of projects. Let me give you another quick example. El Dorado, Arkansas, South Arkansas, Union County. They are doing something that I think will probably be a model for us in this business to really take a look at. Now, there's, they've got a couple of advantages that not every community has, right? They have a, an industrial base and community leaders that saw the vision for incorporating arts and culture into their economic development strategy. But every community can identify their assets. Every community can identify a local champion, and that local champion has political influence, they can bring other people to the table. But picture this. This is a community of about 17,000. They have launched what they call the Eldorado Arts and Festival Initiative. Basically, building on the National Trust Award that they got in the early 90s for their downtown. Some of you may be familiar with Eldorado, Arkansas, and what they were doing in their downtown square. It's about eight blocks. Well, let's fast forward. They saw, because here's the most incredible thing about this story. They were trying to recruit corporate executives to a couple of big companies, one of them called Murphy Bull. Many of you all may have heard that. They're tied to Walmart. If you get gas at Walmart, you're buying their, their gas. And real quickly, I know, now keep you on track on time. You're over 15 minutes, Chris. Oh, <laughs> uh oh, I'll, I'll, I'll come back. There's so many dynamics in this, and I don't have more questions. Yeah. But what's so amazing is I was just there. And what is so amazing about this is that they recognized even a community like that that had some initial seed money, but they're still dealing with the same or the very similar of our problems, regardless of where you are. One, retaining talent being able to recruit talent, and also show to corporate America that this is a place worth investing in. A $75 million initiative, a 3,000 seat venue with the rehabilitation of the Rialto Theater, a 7,000 outdoor <coughs> amphitheater, a children's play space, a farm-to-table restaurant connected in the middle of this district. They have raised over 60 million. All but three million was raised within the community and within Arkansas for a $75 million arts and cultural project. Because they had a serious issue of losing millennials, trying to recruit corporate executives to come to rural America, and they hired some pretty hotshot uh, destination uh, consultants and went through a series of these strategic plans. But the one thing I'll say about that real quickly is that back to my point of inclusion, the entire community and in fact, the whole region in South Arkansas was brought into that discussion. <clears throat> and what did the people want to see in that project? All different stripes, all different parts of politics, from all kinds of demographics. And in fact, that's how they got the children's place kick put into this $75 million project. 
because the community said, we need something like that because they wanted this place to be a destination. They wanted to be able to use this to increase an economic base, to retain and recruit additional talent. Now, not every community can raise 75 million, but here's the one thing that I've learned through this process, is that we do not do a very good job in a lot of my places, in my footprint, of identifying what those local assets are. One of the significant examples of that, how they've done a good job with it, is the Blues Trail in Mississippi. Because it gave the ability to leverage these local communities identifying this particular piece, and they can leverage on the state's efforts to connect all of these things together. And that's what we've seen over the last six, seven, eight years, a major pop-up of some real organized network building, infrastructure building, to create this. I mean, in Mississippi alone, six billion dollars of economic impact in tourism. Now, it's not just tourism alone. Right? Part of this is about trying to be attractive, but at the same time, my last comment. <laughs> my last comment He's a friend, thank God. It's <laughs> also trying to work to raise the cultural awareness of your own citizens at the same time. Right? So anyway, I'm glad to be here. <laughs> Trying to talk about policy, 
to this man I think might be president because, you know, you have to leverage every opportunity when it comes. And he finally looks at me and he said, would you just tell me a little bit about yourself? And I said, well, okay, so I grew up in this state, but I also lived on the south side of Chicago. And he went, you did what? How did I not know this? And I said, bad staff work? <laughs> And there's that stretch of property that goes out to the airport, which is largely farmland. I made a switch because I know he likes baseball. And so I said, Senator, do you know that on any given Sunday in Iowa, there are men who will walk out of cornfields that look just like that to play baseball in a place called the Field of Dreams? And he looked at me, but what was even better was the two guys sitting in the front seat. <laughs> they turned around, oh my God, and I'm thinking, drive, don't do this. <laughs> but at the same time I said, and let me tell you that if you look right now, you see black-eyed Susans blooming on the side of the road, corn that is closing in on eight feet high. It was a beautiful blue sky, much like today, but there were big puffy white clouds out there. For me, a quintessential summer Iowa landscape. I said, do you know what the word Iowa means? In the Meskwaki language, Iowa means beautiful land. Tell me there isn't a more beautiful place right now than where we're driving. <coughs> And then we had a great conversation about baseball. <laughs> the point being, you anchor people to your knowledge of your place. And we do not serve ourselves well when we don't know the stories of the place that we live and call home. And I honestly believe that if you individually cannot tell politicians like I was what that means to you and to other people in this community, then they cannot serve you well. Politicians must know that this story of the place they live in is important is valuable and cannot be discounted, nor can any of the warts and ugliness of some of the places we live be discounted either. It isn't just the pretty stories, because if I talk about Native American history in Lynn County, I have to talk about how the Meskwakis were discounted and segregated and denied their land. Within art, we have those conversations. Someone asked and said yesterday that as a farmer, they weren't listened to and they weren't heard. That is a place we are dying in right now in this political environment because we do not understand that there are thousands upon thousands of people in this country who are desperately afraid. They do not know where their economies are going. They do not have a sense of the future, which means no hope. If we cannot use the inclusion of the places we live to tell a different story, my own fear and anxiety goes up. And I believe that in a very wonderful place like Iowa, whose stories don't often get told a lot because we're very self-deprecating, you know, oh, it's just Iowa, you know. No, it's Iowa. So I think that place has a very, very important place in our discussions about politics, about who we are as people, and 
what the kinds of communities are that we want to build.
with the goal of making sure that federal agencies work together in a way that's more effective and that results in better impacts in rural places. And a lot of that, in fact, most of the work of the White House Rural Council, as we look at it five years later, as we did at the Rural Forum last week, is place-based policy. And it's place-based policy, a lot of it has been focused on, you know, regional economic clusters. Uh, a lot of it has been focused on, particularly in 2009 and 10 and 11, um, in the wake of the Great Recession, really focused on you know, economic job creation. But more and more in the last three or four years, um, there has been a real recognition of the contributions of the National Endowment of the Arts, of the work from Housing and Urban Development and Sustainable Communities Initiative. Um, these leaders, Earl Gold and Chris Massengill, have done this work lifting up the amazing cultural assets of their particular regions. So the, that, that work of the federal agencies, and I would, I'm not gonna go through it, but there is a seven page memo in your packets um, <laughs> that is pretty wonky, um, kind of dry, um, we're not really storytellers, um, <laughs> but it, it was really designed for policymakers in the future, uh, in the next administration, in other places, county policymakers, state policymakers, uh, to be able to see how it can be done when federal agencies try to break down their silos look at the human resources that they have, look at you know, the, the data that they have to empower people to make great places. So, um, so I wanna talk, I'm gonna, you know, I wanna talk more about that, but, but if you're into some dry reading, you should read this. <laughs> no, and, and actually, you, it, is, it is good, and, and it's really, it's not only, this, this document was not only for the policymakers, it was for stakeholders. <laughs> So that stakeholders can go to those policymakers and say, this can be done, it's been done. You know, here's an example. Here's a bunch of examples, actually. So this paper was as much for you as it was for policymakers. Um, the last thing I want to say is just pick up on something that, that Secretary Vilsack, who of course is the chair of the White House Rural Council, um, mentioned, and he said, how important uh, people are to this whole equation. They are absolutely tantamount. The, the role of the federal government is to support the vision and the work and the passion of people. That's, that is what place-based policy, that's what the White House Rural Council has been endeavoring to do, to get the federal government in that role of not leading, dictating, telling, but get it in the role of listening, supporting partners. The foundation has been laid, and it is now up to you and to a bunch of other folks on how to build on that foundation, and that's, I think, what we want to talk about a little bit. Thank you. So, there are folks uh, within the ARC orbit who live in Appalachia who believe that placemaking is actually better in Appalachia. <laughs> and while we don't need to go down that path, placemaking and, and the use and the focus on asset based development is really part of the, of the ARC DNA. It's part of our investment strategy, it's really part of the way we make investments and the way we look at it and work with our communities. When I started as federal co chair, we went through a process uh, and we had been encouraged by um, Senator Byrd at the time to work through and develop a variety of interagency agreements with all the federal agencies with the help of the White House Environmental Council. It was quite a slog. 
And we got it done. But it was a really heavy lift. And the challenge was, how much lifting do we do here, and how much benefit do we get from it? And, and, and there's some, there were some important things that came out of it. But then the White House World Council came along. And all of a sudden, we had a fast track into the work that we're trying to do for case by case basis, program by program, AC by AC basis. And it really changed the dynamics, it changed <coughs> the economics of making those investments. And provide us with a forum and place to reach out and to, to engage those. And uh, we had already had a great relationship with NEA, um, and we worked um, a lot with USDA. But it opened up, um, it really led to the development of things like uh, local foods, local places, rural, the rural job accelerators, um, the work we're starting now with broadband, uh, cool and connected, and just a, a series of initiatives that all of a sudden we're able to make sure that parts of Appalachia had a shot, had a place to, to go, and we're, we're competitive for those federal resources. So it's really been an incredible tool for us to move forward. Now, in our work, you know, I am, uh, uh, I get to travel for a bit, and I come away from that with an incredible level of optimism about the future of Appalachia. You might think, you are crazy, man. What are you talking about? But you know, it's the next best, it's the next great investment opportunity in America. And it is that because of the folks who live there, because of the creativity and the imagination and energy of individuals who, you don't see themselves as entrepreneurs, but they are. They're very committed to their communities, they get up every day, and they work very hard to make sure that their community is going to be a better place for the kids and the grandkids than, than it was for themselves. And that within those communities, that as we move away from one dominant employer, often it opens up the labor market where we're able to provide other activities and take advantage of other opportunities and create other industries and other work. And certainly the arts are an important part of that. And we've seen that really historically throughout Appalachia. And the challenge we have is how do we build the infrastructure? How do we make sure the infrastructure is there, that the ecosystems are there? So when those entrepreneurs collide with those opportunities, the chances and the likelihood of success is great, but they're able to succeed, they're able to move forward. And that's where the challenge I think that we have. You know, the story of, of, of place, of base place economics and development is really about citizen engagement. It's about folks who are very connected to the communities, who have energy, who have vision, who understand it's important not to give up and there will be failure along the way. It's the understanding and the ability to, to, to work together. That this is about addition, not division. That, the, that, the, that, the, that as you go through and as you work to develop your community and take advantage of the assets, it's about adding people. This is not Friday Night Football. This is not about competing against the next town over. It's about collaborating with the next town over. It's about Working your, it's about developing your plan and working your plan. And understanding that this is not, it's not a short-term deal, but it's really a long-term investment. The American economy has been changing virtually every day since the folks landed. Uh, usually when I, when I talk about this, I'm much, a little bit closer. Uh, down the road in Jamestown. And some of those changes have been great. Some of us have really sucked. But at the end of the day, it's how we live. And the more we're engaged in our local communities and looking and planning and developing those opportunities, the better off we are. You know, we have great examples of the use of, of arts uh, throughout Appalachia as a way of strengthening and developing the economy, whether it's, it's in Berea, Kentucky, or the western uh, section of North Carolina, where where the community colleges are, in, are, are also engaged in supporting uh, the development of, of entrepreneurs and artisans. 
the our grade and really our, our pride and joy example is the Crooked Road. The Crooked Road was developed really as a result of a conference we had in, in Western North Carolina uh, with the Made in America folks, where Beck Anderson <coughs> really developed and really brought together the artisans and community. And the next step was the Crooked Road in, in Southwest Virginia and the ability to really begin to organize folks, first around music and then around artisans and then lo around local food and now around manufacturing. So it's, and, and our next generation, our, the next step is something called the One E Road in Ohio, where the mayor of Som uh, Somerset, Ohio, decided that it was time to get together. And he learned and he developed his idea by visiting the road. So this is all about sharing, it's all about understanding each other's visions and being able to move forward in a way that makes sure that your communities are a much greater place for your kids and your grandkids than it was for you. Thanks so much. So I have three things that I thought might be useful um, for me to add into the room for a discussion this morning. The first is, if you'll indulge me, I just want to take a moment to thank publicly Chuck Fluharty, who has become both a hero and a teacher of mine. And working with, um, because I'm lucky enough to work with a lot of formal philanthropy, I spend a lot of time thinking about evaluation and metrics and indicators. And if you want an indicator, a formal indicator of the effect that Chuck has had on my life, um, I work with an iPhone, which has that wonderful predictive text feature. And now when I go to my internet browser and I type in RU, Rupri is the first thing that comes up, and RuPaul is now number two. <laughs> <laughs> See, uh, so that is actually true. Take me now, Lord. Take me now. The second thing I wanted to do is, for those of you who don't know, um, I have, let's call it a blessing, of working with 16 national foundations. And one of the things that I think part of my job is to do is to pick on national philanthropy a little bit. And one of the areas, <laughs> one, of the areas one of the areas that I would love um, help in and partnership in is pushing on national philanthropy when we create national programs that we say are intended for everyone. But by our actions, we only need some of them. Right, so we start national awards for artists, and then magically all of the artists who are awarded live in New York, Chicago, and Los Angeles. We start national programs where we say these are for every kind of American, but we don't see any Native Americans. So one of the things that um, I've talked about a lot in rural settings is it is so important for us to come together as a rural community and talk about our rural issues. The other thing that is really important is that we make a concerted effort to show up at the everyone conversation. So when there is a national conversation on housing, we need to make sure that rural is there and that it's overrepresented. Because we're so often invisible, we need to make sure that we're doubly visible. When we show up, uh, uh, when there is a national conversation on land use policy, we need to make sure that everyone is there, both urban and rural. So the, the request, the offer I would make to the room is, is for you to join me and tell me the support and help you need in showing up and representing the everyone conversation. <coughs> and then the third thing I'd offer is um, I believe very much in the power of place-based philanthropy, and I'll say why in a moment. And I also want to give us a pretty major caveat, right? So one of the things that we need more of is focusing on what we have in common, the areas of agreement, right? Because the definition of collaboration is everyone is trying to do the same thing. Right? And caring about the places we live and work is a pretty easy way to get everyone in the community to roll up and agree on the thing that we have to do together. So I love that invitation to come together. I love that invitation to policy. The thing that it absolutely has to be twinned with, however, is an insistence on disaggregating data. Because if we only look at the place indicators rolled up that far, we don't understand how policies are playing out among the individuals who live there. I was just in Minneapolis, St. Paul, and if you look at the Twin Cities on an aggregate level, it's something like the number third best place to live in the United States, right? On every indication, there are fabulous things that are happening. If you begin disaggregating that data by race, you start seeing very different pictures. 
So I believe that our policy, our focus, our coming together absolutely needs to be place-based and based on what we have in common. And I believe that the way we measure our work, the way we change our work, the way we evaluate our work is by looking at all of the differences among the people who have in common and see how those things play out. So as we are have this both sort of federal policy, state policy, philanthropic focus on this place-based policy, I want to insist that it always be twinned with that disaggregation of data. So those are three things that I would offer into the room and look forward to talking more with everyone today. Hi, everybody. Hi. I thought this was Rural America. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Huge thanks to Chuck and Matt. This might be the largest gathering ever of people talking about the role of arts in creating rural communities, and I want to congratulate you guys for that. That's good. Endowment <laughs> perspective about this meeting, and it's just been awesome to be here. Um, I thought I could offer really quickly just kind of how I think we got here and where I think we're going from the federal perspective around creative placemaking. So. Um, when the White House said all agencies should focus on place, the NEA stepped up and said yes, and we kind of pursued that in three ways. The first was creating the Our Town program. How many Our Town grade twos are in here? Good number, cool. Um, <laughs> the second was uh, to go to foundations and to see if we could get them to invest in it. Became Our Place. How many Our Place grade twos are in here? Yay! <laughs> There should be more of all of you. <laughs> Come talk to us afterwards. <laughs> um, and then uh, the third was the federal relationships, which I, is really, really important. And I'll talk about kind of uh, where that's gone. So um, the first phase was kind of getting all that off the ground. There was a lot of going over to other federal agencies when, and saying, like, hey, we exist. And I mean, we didn't even know that USDA did rural development, that they were the primary people who did that. So when we first started, so that, Check. <laughs> we made it that far. Um, uh, uh, and then, uh, and, so, and we were just kind of getting all the funds going, everything. The second phase was very much about, okay, so what are the standards of practice of this, right? It's not rocket science. We like to joke at the endowment that we're not the nuclear program, right? We're not gonna send a man to the moon or Mars now. Um, but, or a woman, excuse me. <laughs> um, so we, uh, are really interested in like what are these do these things actually look like? What do they cost? And then how do we spread that knowledge into the different networks? Which is I think what this meeting is very much about. So as part of that phase two, we created a series of grants at the endowment that were all about funding existing networks or important policy places like Rupri um, to just sort of imbue this knowledge into uh, these kind of standards of practice into what they're doing already. So the fact that Rupri has engaged <coughs> this to this level. Um, and if they're taking it as seriously they, as they are is unbelievably important for from a policy perspective. I just have to reemphasize that. Chuck is modest. They are so freaking important. They are all up over all the federal and state policy people. Um, and so the fact that they're engaging the arts as an important piece of the, the puzzle that they're talking to all these folks about is just, it's, it's enormously important. So we're um, excited about what that phase three might be of important Thing that has happened at the Fed level, I just want to talk about real quick. Where's Jen Hughes? Oh, she's back there in the corner. So, um, Jen just got a promotion, and it's part of the work at the federal agencies, which is all about permanently, on a staff level, building out a place based frame beyond this administration. So, when Sean Donovan, Sean Donovan who was formerly at HUD, went over to the Office of Management and Budget, he created something called the Community Solutions Partnership. Who doesn't love more federal wonky terms, right? <laughs> um, as if creative placemaking wasn't wonky enough. So uh, the Community Solutions Partnership was all about how do we get the federal agencies, now they've built all these relationships, we're focusing on place to do it permanently. So there were kind of three strategies. One was a legal strategy. So 18 agencies have signed an MOU saying we're going to keep working this way. It was a hustle for lots of lawyers. <laughs> Uh, the second strategy was to create permanent staff level positions or people who would be high enough up and have enough power to continue to work across agencies <coughs> to continue to help communities. Jen is our person at the NEA. Um, please go talk to her. And then uh, the third strategy was to train a lot of the, the kind of people who work on these issues all the time but don't kind of know each other and just how to work this way more. Um, so there's been about almost a I think six or seven hundred federal uh, staff people now train on how to work in helping places um, 
and how to coordinate our, our resources. So we just are kind of getting to know each other better. So it, this is all to say it's early days around the play space frame at the federal level. We're getting to know each other better. Like I personally was thrilled at the session you had yesterday with the state arts agencies and the USCA um, state folks sitting in the same room saying, hey, we're working together now. That, from like a federal policy nerd perspective, is a huge win. I was just thrilled to see that, because even maybe six or seven years ago, none of those relationships existed. So it is early days. We're excited about what the phase three is going to look like. I can't predict what's going to happen in three weeks. I don't know what that's going to look like for at the federal level. But I can say that there is a permanent staff level effort to keep going on this, and we're in it to win it. And I'll leave it there for more conversation. I believe the people in this room are the right people to align with this challenge and build a future that's about the people you advocate for every day. I had a football coach who would always say for every game, boys, you never know the most important moments in your life when they're happening to you. That's usually before we went out and got the hell beaten <laughs> But I don't think we can let this moment pass without capturing it. I really don't. And we're going to try to allow the rest of this morning to do that. Uh, we're going to take a break here in a minute. Please don't leave, because now is the chance to dialogue with these people and then dialogue with yourself. This room is open until God comes. I will not let them walk in the doors <laughs> afterwards to get together. We're going to have themes on the walls, and Teresa's going to take you through a facilitation. If there's a thing you want to start to build a community about, on your, on your tables will be just post-it notes. Put something up there, and let's look and start to align. Close with a story. First thing I want to say is, it is such an honor and a privilege to have this panel. I want to tell you, in, we have been working the Hill for 35 years. We have never had a cadre of servant public leaders like these ladies and gentlemen. Let's express our appreciation. <laughs> With all of you in the breakouts, we wish we had four hours, because there's four hours of great <coughs> stories. I want to I play off, too, what Doug said about what that young guy in that decision between agriculture and the arts had to go through. That should never, ever happen again in America. They're alive. Secondly, Jamie was... Jamie, Jamie was so honest. I'm going to share two facts with you, and we're going to take a break. Because of CDBG and other things, these gentlemen working in the federal infrastructure every year have two to $300 less per capita in federal funding to give to rural community and economic development as opposed to urban. That has been the history for 30 years in the federal government. That is $23 billion a year. That is every year. You ask why rural America's communities look different, that's the first thing. Secondly, American philanthropy is only doing outlays at perhaps 90, maybe 9 or 10 percent. Our, our personal belief is it's more like 3. 3 percent of American philanthropy, 6 percent, for 75 percent of the land mass and 25 percent of the people that must steward the leadership for an urban nation in the future, it is unwise philanthropic policy. We have to think about this. I'll end with a story. Ryan last night is not the only cowboy in the room. Sam Corris is a cowboy. He's in Wrigleyville right now, but he used to be a bull rider. Hit his head once too much, and he went to work as a leader in Rubri. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> We honestly came from a ranching and, fit and farming family. We lost our farm in the last crisis in agriculture. We saved the old place. I'm going to tell you a story about that. We're in Hearts Gravel County. There's high walls all over our county. We were, uh, we were running cattle above a 
nine-foot vertical high wall. At the bottom of it was, a, was an underground mine that Consolidation Coal Company had. This is a true story, folks, and it's a metaphor, and I'll connect it at the end. <laughs> there was a lovely young heifer out there walking through that field one day, and two amorous males of the bovine connection took an interest in this young lass, and they began to fight. And I'm sitting in the pickup truck watching this from the other side of the high wall. And they're fighting and fighting, and they're getting near and near to that high wall. And one of them pushes the other one over the high wall. Now, my initial thought was, holy shit, $1,600 down the drain. But, but my second thought was, this is going to get interesting. Because that wall fell right into the entree porter for the Consolidation Coal Company deep mine at 3 o'clock when the shift was coming off. <laughs> that bull fell, <laughs> got up, thought about himself a little, and looked around and saw a human being coming out with a light on and stuff, and they were kind of tired. And he is ticked at something. <laughs> and that looks like something to solve it on. <laughs> there were 70 guys coming out of that shift that had the worst afternoon of their life. <laughs> they were up on pickup trucks. They were scrambling on eyeballs. And bulls <laughs> were running. Funnier than hell. <laughs> True story. The point. <laughs> Old teacher in me. I could pray for Rome America, but this is more fun. <laughs> the point. That bull attacked a lot of people that got harmed because it wasn't their fault. He needed to solve an issue with that other bull at the top of the high wall. My sense of the arts community is because we're so project-based, we end up fighting with other project-based people because there's not enough projects, there's not enough money. And you know at the community level, if you don't build the human glue to sustain your commitment to the rural way of life, it fails. We must find a way to build sustaining structures for the amazing work you all do. I hope we can do that this afternoon. I think these six wonderful servants can help, but it's mainly around these tables. Please only take 10 minutes. Here's the deal. The breakout food is here. Take 10 minutes. We'll give everyone a, a bathroom break. The rest of the day is yours for Q&A and to chat together. Let's give this panel our first <laughs>